Sometimes you just got to take your breath, right? Hey, um, we're starting a, a series this morning. You saw the, the graphic, Made for More. We are going to go through the summer, and we're going to do this series, Made for More. No matter who you are, how long you follow Christ, you need to understand and realize you were made for more. Uh, a lot of times we kind of get in this routine of, I get up, I go to work, I come home, I go to church on Sunday, I go home, and I repeat the pattern. That's not the pattern that God has for our lives. You were made for more. This summer we're going to dive into uh, the Holy Spirit. God has so much more in store for each one of us. As we live our lives, we walk with him. We challenge you this, this summer, each week, that you would prayerfully listen and think about who the Holy Spirit is to you and what he does and what he wants to accomplish specifically in your life. If you don't already know, he wants to do so much more, not only in you, but through you. There are people around you that you see every day that you don't even realize what they're walking through. They hide stuff from you, but he knows. And he wants to use you to speak life into them. That's our responsibility as Christians. Everywhere we go is to speak life into those around us. And the Holy Spirit makes us more as we allow him to. During our time together, our prayer is that um, we will each discover that we were made for more. You're going to hear that phrase a lot. We're going to say that a lot. We were made for more. We allow the Holy Spirit to bring to completion what he started in our life. That's our prayer. We sang a song um, a minute ago that you finish what you started. And it's scriptural. The Bible says, the God says, I will finish. He will finish what he starts. What he starts, he finishes. And our prayer is this summer, you will allow the Holy Spirit to define and complete what he's already started in your life. Now, it may not be complete this summer, but it will take you to a next point where you can continue to progress in your life. Amen? In John 14, verse 16 and 17, Jesus is talking to the disciples, and he says this, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all the truth. The world cannot receive him because it is not looking for him and doesn't recognize him, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in with you. It will be in you. Sorry. We're going to dive into the Holy Spirit this summer, but today I want to just simply start off, and for some of you, I want to introduce you to the Holy Spirit. For some of you, you've known the Holy Spirit for years, but sometimes it's good to go back and get a refresher of who he really is. I want you to look at the person next to you. Guys, if your wife is here, I want you to look at your wife. Kids, look at your mom. If you don't have a spouse or a mom or whatever, Look at somebody next to you that you admire, that you look up to, or you know really well, and I want you to repeat after me. You are my favorite it. Listen, they got really close to that, really quiet that last part, but I'm still sad I didn't hear any. Like, you, nobody slapped anybody, so I'm proud of you for controlling yourself. That's good. Listen, I, I'm being silly because it's hard for me to just be serious all the time. I can't hardly do it. But we tend to treat the Holy Spirit just like that. We tend to say it, it. And we need to understand the Holy Spirit is he. See, I have three kids here with me today. Well, not in here, but they're here. I didn't tell you my three it's are here today, right? Sometimes parents, I know, sometimes we feel like that. But my three wonderful children are here today. And it's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. He is here with us today, not it. It refers to an item or an object that we can pick up and put down at any given time. If you know me, I love baseball, hence the baseball glove, because what better opportunity to throw baseball into a series or a sermon than talking about an it. If you walk into my office, there's a lot of stuff on my shelves. This is one of those items, because you know what? You never know when you need a good game of catch, just to relax. And it is always on my shelf. Its purpose is to sit on my shelf until I pick it up and use it. The Holy Spirit is he. He doesn't sit on a shelf. He goes everywhere with me. He's my advocate. He is my comforter. He's my strength. He's my guide. He is a he, not an it, not a thing, but a person. We tend to treat him often like an object. Um, A missionary friend of ours once made this statement, he said, where I go to serve, the Holy Spirit is a necessity for our life. In America, 
we treat him like he's a luxury. And if you don't agree with that, then look around because that's exactly how we treat the Holy Spirit. Oh, I'm good. I don't really need the Holy Spirit today. Listen, I saw a funny meme on Facebook or somewhere. It said, do, you, do I need the Holy Spirit to go to heaven? They said, no, you need the Holy Spirit to go to Walmart. Like, you need the Holy Spirit. When we get to the point of understanding the Holy Spirit is not an extra, he is essential, then we begin to understand the concept that we were made for more. We were made for more than just coming to church on Sunday, or coming to a Bible study or just reading the Bible. We were made for more, and the Holy Spirit gives us that more and takes us to those more places. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's essential. He is not an extra. The Bible defines the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Counselor, the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Grace, the Spirit of God. In John chapter 16, Jesus is talking to the disciples, and he says this. He says, but in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin. Now, can I just pause for just a second, and let me explain that passage, that little point right there. The Holy Spirit will convict the world of its sin. Not me. And not you. It is not my job or your job to walk around to my family, to my friends or co-workers or whoever it is and convict them of their sin. That is the Holy Spirit's job. But what I know is that when I walk into some place and I walk in with the Holy Spirit, guess what he begins to do? He begins to convict. You know why people don't like you at work? Because when you walk in with the Holy Spirit, they don't like the conviction that they're feeling. See, my responsibility and your responsibility is to walk in and to speak the truth. The truth of the gospel, the truth of Jesus. But when I speak the truth, he begins to convict those that are around me. Let's carry on. He will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. There is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said, the spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. Jesus is explaining to the disciples I got to go away. I can't stay with you. If I don't stay with you, the Father can't send you more. Because you're made for more than, listen, you're made for more than just spending time with Jesus. You're made for more. He goes on later to tell the disciples, all these things that I've done, you will do greater things. You will do more. Why? Because when the Spirit comes, he allows us to do more because we're made for more. In essence, Jesus is saying, listen, if it was me, I would be talking to my family. Jesus is talking to us. I was, I'm talking to my family. I'm going, hey, I have a relative who is filthy rich, and they've passed away. And they left me an inheritance, but the only way I can receive their inheritance is that I have to go where they lived. You can't come with me. But you need to stay here, and, and I, I'm going to go because in order for me to receive this inheritance, I have to go live over here. But if I go, I can send you thousands and thousands more to bless you than if I stay with you. Does that make sense? Jesus is saying, my father has left me an inheritance. My father has got great things for you, but if I stay here, I can't send them to you. But if I go to be with my father, then I can send the comforter. I can send the advocate to be with you. Jesus described the Holy Spirit in terms that reflect the Spirit's personality. He referred to the Holy Spirit as someone who guides and comforts us in our walk with God. The Holy Spirit talks with us, listens to us, listens to our concerns. He's a constant companion we can count on to provide guidance when we don't know which direction to go. You know those days, if you don't have them, I do, where I'm like, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm not, I don't, I don't. I'm done, God. What do I do? And the Holy Spirit, typically he says, just trust me. And take the next step. 
Well, but I, I can't see a way down here. He goes, I didn't ask you to see a way down there. I ask you to let me guide you and be your comforter. Take the next step and I'll take care of what follows from there. See, the problem many of us have is that we can't hear the Holy Spirit speak or, or guide because we've already determined in our heart that we're not gonna listen to what he says anyways. But we're quick to complain because he doesn't speak. That's real. Some personalities, personal characteristics of the Holy Spirit, he has intellect. First Corinthians 2.11 says, no one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. He has emotions. Ephesians 4.30, do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. The way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. And one of my favorite stories from our, our trip in, to Guatemala a couple weeks ago, um, we got to do a little food outreach thing, and this lady, the pastor's wife, got to give up, get up, and she began to speak to everybody that came to get this food. And when she did, she spoke the gospel. She said, you need to understand your soul will one day stand before God, and you will give an account for your life. You either lived for him or you lived against him, but you need to understand. And she began to just speak the truth. What she didn't begin to tell them was what they were doing wrong. She began to tell them that Jesus loves them. He died for them on the cross. He died to pay the sin, the punishment of sin that they owe. And she began to share the gospel. Why? Because her point right there with the Holy Spirit was leading her to do was to reach on the emotions of you got a place to, to live in heaven, but we're going to honor the Holy Spirit and we're going to give him what is his and listen. The Holy Spirit has a will. 1 Corinthians 12, 11, it is one and only, it is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. The Holy Spirit has actions. He speaks. If you've never experienced the Holy Spirit speaking, continue to ask God for more and you'll experience. Acts 13, 2 says, one day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. He spoke. He teaches, John 14, 26, but when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. One of my favorite questions that I, um, I think, I feel like we get a lot as, as pastors is people will say, well, I wanted to share the gospel, but I don't know what to say. I don't know how to do it. It's very simple. You just be obedient and allow the Holy Spirit to teach you because he will give you the words that you need to say to that person. It may not make, this is what I've learned, it may not make any sense to you, but when I begin to be obedient and I'm like, God, I want more, I want to be more, I want to be used for more, just use me. And I begin to speak what he puts in my heart and it doesn't make sense to me, but to that person, they go, wow, you've really been in touch with God. Well, I just spoke what he gave me. But when he speaks, he teaches us what to say and what to do. The Holy Spirit convicts. We read it earlier, but let's read it again, John 16, 8. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. One of my favorites, the Holy Spirit intercedes on my behalf. Romans 8, 26 through 27 says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. I'm thankful for the, for the moments that the Holy Spirit does that because there are days, if I'm just being honest, that I'm human just like anybody else, and I don't always pray in accordance to God's will. And I'm thankful that for some reason at those times, God seems to make me just kind of be quiet, and the Holy Spirit begins to pray for me, things that I don't really know what I need to say, but he does, and God does. And together, they pray in alignment, in agreement, of what needs to be prayed. And he begins to do things that I can't do on my own. The Holy Spirit can be tested. Acts chapter five, you read the story of Ananias and Sapphira who together, uh, husband and wife, they came together and decided to sell some property and they decided uh, together, hey, we're gonna tell everybody we sold it for this much, but really it was this much. We're gonna keep a little bit for ourselves. You can, he can be uh, tested. Acts chapter five, verse nine, Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this. 
they had already had this discussion. They were going to go to, to Peter and tell him, but they had already discussed what they were going to lie and, and test the Holy Spirit. You go back a little few ch- uh, verses before in verse 3, and the Holy Spirit can be lied to. In Acts 5, 3, it says, Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. Sometimes the lie isn't necessarily even what comes out of our mouth, but the lie is what we've decided in our heart against the Holy Spirit. Because you notice he didn't say you lied to me. He said you lied to the Holy Spirit. Well, that was a deceptive heart moment that they had before they even had a conversation. The Holy Spirit can be insulted and blasphemed. In Hebrews 10, 29, it says this, just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant, which made us holy, as if it were common and unholy, and have insulted in this day in the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. Matthew 12, 31 and 32 says, So I tell you, every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which will never be forgiven. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, either in this world or in the world to come. Blasphemy is a big word. I had to research it as well, so don't, don't worry. Blasphemy is this. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is an absolute denial of what the Spirit is saying about Jesus. What is he saying? He's saying this. Jesus is Lord. He is the Son of God. Confess him as Lord. George O. Wood, in his book, Living in the Spirit, he's our, our former general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, he, re- he made this statement. He said, it is important to understand that any person who fears he or she has committed the unpardonable sin still spiritually sensitive and has not committed that sin. Rather, the person who reaches this level of blasphemy no longer has any desire to receive God's grace and forgiveness because the Spirit no longer convicts that person's conscience of sin. That's a lot. Let me give it to you in a nutshell. If you're concerned that you've spoken against the Holy Spirit, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you're good because you're still allowing the Lord to convict your heart. He says, when you've gotten to that place where you've blasphemed the Holy Spirit, you don't care. You couldn't care less if you did or not. No big deal. It is what it is. So if you still are concerned, if you still have that, that question, he's saying you are still listening to the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit. Listen, I said earlier, we need to understand the Holy Spirit as a person, but he's more than just a person. The Holy Spirit is a divine person. What does that mean? He's, divine. he's not just merely a person. He's one who is infinitely holy, infinitely wise, and infinitely mighty, yet at the same time, he's wonderfully tender, sensitive, and compassionate. He's all these things at the same time. He is a divine being. He is a divine person. You and I are people. He is a divine person, a divine being. A basic, tr- a basic teaching of the Christian church is the Trinity. The Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're all three separate, but they're all three one. It doesn't make a lot of sense sometimes. It's hard to wrap our, our brains around. I'm going to give it to you this way. If you go to a refrigerator, some of you guys don't have to keep your eggs in the refrigerator, but if you go to a refrigerator and grab an egg, or if you're farm fresh, grab it off the shelf. There's an egg. There's a shell, there's an egg white, and there's a yolk. All three of those different items make up one egg. It's an egg. They all three have different parts but they're one egg. The Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're all three different, but they're all three one. They're all three God together, but they're all three separate as well. I know it's confusing, but it's scriptural. We can, we'll dive into it later. One of Jesus' last instructions to his followers was demonstrating the equality and nature of each member of the Trinity when he said in Matthew 28, 19, therefore go and made disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three. In Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, we see the cooperation and mutual respect of, of the members of the Trinity in Jesus' baptism. It says this, When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descended, him, descended on him in bodily form like a dove, And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. God the Father spoke, God the Holy Spirit descended, God the Son was baptized. All three at one time. 
2 Corinthians 13, 14, Paul provides proof of the doctrine of the Trinity. He says, may the grace of Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Holy Spirit is fully God, has all the power and attributes of God and deserves the respect, reverence, and obedience due to God. You understand, there are three, but there are one. He is still God. The Holy Spirit had a role in creation in Genesis 1, 1 through 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings creation out of chaos. You're going through chaos, then allow the Holy Spirit to bring creation out of that chaos. Well, I don't understand. We heard it earlier. You don't have to understand. You have to have faith that he will do what he says he will do. The Holy Spirit had a role in salvation. He's the convicting agent that draws us to Christ. He is the convicting agent that draws us to Christ. Listen, can I just be honest? As I sit over worship, I felt the Lord say this to me this morning. There are some of you in this room that you're going, why am I here? What's the point of me being here? This guy keeps talking about the Holy Spirit and convicting. I don't even know why I'm here. You're here because the Holy Spirit has drawn you to a place where he wants to have a moment to tell you that he loves you, that God loves you, that he cherishes you, that you he wants to call you his son. He wants to call you his daughter. But he has to convict you and boil you in before you can meet him in that place. But as he convicts us and pulls us in, he begins to show us how to change. It's not my responsibility to convict you. It's my responsibility to give you the truth. And as I speak truth, he begins to show you what you have to do. The Holy Spirit draws us to God through his son, John 16, 8. When he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and God's righteousness and the coming judgment. John 6, 44, it says, For no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. At the last day, I will raise them up. How does the Father draw us to him? Through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And as he draws us in, it's my choice to either accept or deny his invitation. In John 20, 22, we see Jesus fulfilling the promise he made to the disciples. Back in John 14, he made a promise to the disciples. And in John 20, we see him fulfilling it. And it says, and with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This, this part of the scripture refers to regeneration or a new life. He's breathing on them and saying, new life. Breathing new life into them by receiving the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for breathed right here in this, this verse is the same word used in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, where it says um, that God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Well, these guys are already living, so how can it be the same, the same reference, the same definition? Because at this moment where Jesus is speaking to the disciples, receive the Holy Spirit, what he's saying is this. God breathed into physical man, life, and he became a new creation. When Jesus says these words and breathes on them, He's breathing into disciples' spiritual life and they become a new creation in spirit. Some of us this morning, that's what God wants to do is speak life back into you, breathe life into you, not physical life. Some of you, it is physical life. Some of it is spiritual. The Holy Spirit, we read throughout the the Bible, um, he has these characteristics, but he also is referenced in the Bible through symbols. Now, a symbol is not the actual person or item. The symbol is a symbol, right? The symbol helps us understand. The rainbow is a symbol of God's promise to never flood the earth again. The rainbow is not the promise. God's promise is his word. The rainbow is a symbol of what he said. The Holy Spirit is is, uh, mentioned in scripture. He comes like a wind. He's not the wind, but he comes like the wind. He refreshes like water. He's not water, but he refreshes like the water. We also read that he's a uh, seal. He's the seal. A seal is both a sign of ownership and authenticity. The Holy Spirit is God's seal that we belong to him and his deposit guarantee that he will do what he has promised. The Holy Spirit is not a seal, but he's like a seal. Do you understand the difference? Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says this, 
And you, and now you Gentiles, have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believe in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22 says, It is God who enables us along with you to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us and he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit on our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised us. Everything he has promised us, not what we have promised us. There's a difference. The truth is none of us can imagine and fathom the reality of spending eternity in heaven. We can't even begin to imagine what it's going to be like to eternally stand in the presence of God. But we do get a taste of it through the Holy Spirit's constant presence in our life here on earth. Even this imperfect world we live in, imperfect world, when we allow the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit to have a constant presence in our life, we begin to get a small taste of what it's going to be like to be in God's presence for eternity. I think it's very vital that we must understand the Holy Spirit is a divine being. He's a divine being. He's not an it. He's not an item, an object that I set on a shelf and pick up when it's convenient. He's a divine being who goes with me, my comforter, my guidance, the truth, the convictor. It's also important to understand that the Holy Spirit convicts us. He doesn't condemn us. The enemy condemns us. The Holy Spirit convicts us. The condemn, condemnation is to push us away from God. The conviction is to pull us toward God. The Holy Spirit can be ignored and he can be insulted. He wants to be my helper. He wants to be your helper because I need him to be more. I'm created for more. You're created for more. We're made for more, but it has to be through him. But it's my choice to allow him or not. The Holy Spirit speaks. Is my choice to listen. Author Mark Batterson says this, if you want to hear his comforting voice, you have to be willing to listen to his convicting voice as well. So often we want the Holy Spirit to speak to us and give us comfort and peace. And he says, before I can do that, I need to convict you of some things that you are doing that go against the word of God. I need to get those things cleared up so that I can then speak the peace that comes through cleaning up your life my way. We also must realize that the Holy Spirit is not extra. He is essential. He's not a luxury. He's a essential. If Jesus, the Son of God himself, needed this ongoing relationship and partnership with the Holy Spirit to complete the work that God put him on earth for, then how much more do you and I need that relationship and that partnership with the Holy Spirit? We were made for more. Every one of us in this room, we sang a song earlier, if I'm not dead, you're not done. If you're not dead and we're not dead, he's not done with us. We were made for more. Don't settle for less. Don't settle for being okay. We're made for more. Go for more. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the day. That today, the chance to be in your presence, to be in your house, that you would speak to us. That you would remind us this morning we're made for more. We're not made for just the mundane, everyday life, but we're made for more to be more for you, to be more through you and more in you. But God, today, would you help us clearly hear your voice calling us to allow you to take us to the next level? Lord, not that we would ask or beg of gifts, but we would just ask or beg of more of you. God, would you just give us all that you have for us, that we would be able to dive into you, that we begin to go more into you, begin to dig deeper into you and who you are, that we would know you more, that we would know you in a greater way, that as we begin to know you, you begin to let us see you move through us as well. Lord, thank you for the opportunity you've given us today to be in your presence and to be in your house. Thank you for what you've started. Thank you for what you're doing. Church, can I ask you just, well, I'd like to ask you two quick questions and that's it, we're gonna be done. The first one is this. I, for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit prompted my heart during worship but there are some of us in this room that you don't know why you're here. Whether you're a student, an adult, 
You've been coming for months and years. But today you've come in with the thought of, I don't even know why I'm here. I don't even know why I'm coming. I don't know why I'm in this place. But this morning the Holy Spirit is saying, you're here because I called you because I wanted to speak to you. Because I've got some things that I want to show you. And listen, you may be here and you may have a relationship with Jesus and you may be walking just great. But today he wants to just remind you, you're made for more. Stop settling for the mundane. Stop settling for the mediocre and dive into me so that I can take you to the more, so I can give you the more, so that I can show you that you're more, so that I can show you and take you where I need you to go. Some of you this morning, you're here, and he's going, you're here because I needed to convict you of some things you've been doing wrong that I call wrong. Not people, other things, but people, what I call wrong. And today I need to show you that we need to take some steps and get out of that stuff. If that's you, and you would say, Pastor Jason, that's me. This morning, the Holy Spirit is opening my eyes, opening my heart to see he pulled me here for a reason. That you can ask you just a real quick, raise your hand. Nobody's looking around, it's me, you, and Jesus. Cool, cool. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. The next thing I want to ask you is this. Are you here this morning and you would just say, you know what, so, something this morning that stirred my heart and I've been satisfied and I realize I need to dig in and I need to go deeper because I've made for more than what I'm allowing myself to be. And today the Holy Spirit is pushing me. Let me take you to new places so I can do more in you and through you. If that's you, can ask you real quick just to raise your hand and put it back down. Awesome, awesome. Would you stand with me this morning? Here's what I'd like to do. There are a lot of you that raised your hands for, for both of those questions. Can I just say thank you for being obedient to the Holy Spirit? It wasn't me. But can I ask you to just stretch yourself this morning? Our prayer team is here. They would love to pray with you. They're, they're waiting and ready. But can I ask you, would you, this is going to stretch a lot of us, would you just put your hand on the shoulder of the person next to you? Because what I've learned is that sometimes in order for me to get what God's receiving, what, what God's asking me to have, I gotta be stretched and pray for somebody else. Because when I take my eyes off of me and I begin to focus on God moving in someone else, he begins to give me more than I could ever imagine. And there are a lot of you that raise your hand. And can I ask you, just, you don't have to ask the person their name. You don't have to ask them what, if they raise their hand or not. Would you just pray for the person next to you that the Holy Spirit would push them into more? For some of them, they raise their hand and said, I, you know, he's convicting me, he's showing me things. For some of you, you said, I need, to go, I need to go more. So can I ask you as I pray, would you pray for the person next to you? Lord, thank you. Thank you for every person this morning that raised their hand and said, Lord, you're either convicting me or you're showing me this morning that I've been mundane, I've been going through the motions and you created me for more. But Lord, as we admit those things, would you speak to us today? Would you calm our nerves? Would you calm us? The, the chaos and, the, and the, the craziness in our minds and our hearts. Would you just, Holy Spirit, would you give us peace this morning that only you can give? That as we go, I'm yours. I'm yours. Show me what to change. Show me what to do. For some of us this morning, Lord, we're simply saying, Holy Spirit, I'm ready. You show me. You've, you've told me. Stop being mundane. Stop going through the motions. It's time to go deeper. It's time for me to chase after you. It's time for you to show me that I was made for more. It's time for you to take me to more places and do more things for you. And today, would you let us see those things? Holy Spirit, this morning, as we understand who you are and how much you have for us and how much you mean to us, would you allow us this morning to experience a moment with you as you speak directly to every one of us what you have for us? And would you help us to receive what you're speaking to us, that we'd walk out of here excited for where you're taking us to more? Lord, we thank you this morning for what you've done and for what you have planned for us. In Jesus' name. Thank you for watching and worshiping with us today. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a video or a live stream. And please share this video with your friends and family. If this message has encouraged you today, please let us know in the comments as we would love to connect with you. And thank you so much for your generosity. Because of you and your faithful giving, together we share the gospel around the world. So please visit our website, crumbcc.church and use the giving link. God bless you. We can't wait to worship with you again next week.